Westmore, here you are, many would say a political upstart running for governor of Maryland, a state that the whole country might not be looking at. But if we look closely, this state is a microcosm, both the problems here and the opportunities for the rest of the country to look at. How do you see this race? Why do you want this job? I look at Maryland in many ways, people call it America in miniature, right? We also know that so many of the challenges that you see around the country are right here in the state of Maryland. We could have some of the best medical institutions in the world right here in the state of Maryland. And you have people who live down the street from them who can't afford basic care. Why? Why is this state, even this city of Baltimore, yeah. divided like that? I think you have to be intentional about inclusiveness. And you have to be intentional about not leaving people behind. Those are fancy words. How would you solve it? You know, when I think about the work that we were able to do when I ran one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country, you know, the work that we were able to do is say that our policies need to actually reflect our values. It means creating an education system that is not leaving children behind or having when they leave high school, that they're not prepared for the jobs of now or for the jobs of the future. Let's talk about those job opportunities. When I came into this town, this city today, like many other cities, my car was approached by those squeegee men. And I understand their position. They live in a tough city and there's not a lot of great opportunities for them. And they're there washing windows. And for those people who are driving into town, they might not want to drive into the city because they don't feel safe. How do you solve for both of those people? Yeah, I mean, well, first thing, we, we need to be able to ensure that we can get the kids off of the corners because they're not safe there. But we also know that you cannot criminalize poverty. These kids are there because they are in dire poverty, dire situations of poverty. And so that means actually creating pathways for their economic success, means actually creating and working with the private sector and working across sectors to be able to incentivize them to be able to enter into a workforce, having a better education system and also better housing and transportation system. That's not having them believe that being on the corner washing windows in 95 degree weather is the best option for them. You know, this, this is an issue that, that Baltimore and many cities around the country have been dealing with for a very, very long time. Well, what you're talking about are long-term solutions. And while we desperately need them, we live in a world of short-termism. And you are running for office where people are saying, how do you solve this day one? How are you going to get those young men into better jobs? And how are you going to get people outside this city back to work in this city? Because I'll tell you, being here feels like a ghost town. Well, one of the top priorities that we have to be able to do for our state government is you've got to get people back to work. Uh, it's the best way we're going to deal with these measures of inflationary pressure. It's the best way we're going to deal with all the other economic challenges that we continue to see. So we've got to focus on job retraining and job reskilling and get people back to work now. It also means that we've got to be able to do things like increase wages. Part of the biggest challenge we have within the state of Maryland is we have people who are working jobs, in some cases multiple jobs, and still living below a poverty line. If we are not finding ways of increasing wages and making work worthwhile for people, you're never going to create a proper pathway for people to be able to fill the jobs that are actually on board and available now. Those are things that the state can uniquely work and fix on. Crime is an issue in Maryland, specifically in Baltimore and across the country. Yeah. You are seeing more and more voters put crime as their number one issue. Yeah. This city that we're in has had 200 murders this year. That's basically a person dying every day. How are you going to solve for that? Well, I, I can tell you the issue of, of crime is not just important, it's personal. Uh, I am, I'm a, I'm a very proud Baltimorean. It's also something that the city alone should not have to wrestle with. This is where partnership matters. You can take state resources, put them on loan to the city of Baltimore to be able to help address that. Investing in the violent inter intervention programs like Safe Streets and We Are Us, these are programs that the data shows and are proven to work. And right now they are underfunded, undervalued, and we have to change that from day one. We sort of default to this narrative. Maybe it's a false narrative that when crime is a priority, the law and order party is the Republican Party. You recently got the endorsement of the police union here. Can you speak to that? I, uh, you know, I, I, I wear something. These are my dog tags that I got when I was 17 years old, when I first joined the Army. Um, in fact, I was so young, my mother had to sign the paperwork for me because I couldn't even sign the paperwork when I first joined the Army. Um, I proudly defended this country in uniform. 
I proudly defended this country overseas with the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, and so I know there is no body nor any party that can lecture me on what it means to defend our society. I also know that being able to focus on public safety and keeping people safe, there is no party that has that market cornered and definitely not the Republican Party. How do you feel then about the term defund the police? Because it's put a brand on Democrats that doesn't align with what you're talking about. I don't think that the answer is, is defund the police because I think defund the police is more of a slogan than a strategy, right? The strategy that we have is just fundamentally going back to the idea that everybody has a right to feel safe in their own communities. And they want to know that if something happens and they call on law enforcement to be able to protect them, that that is going to be, that the response is going to be quick and the response is going to be supportive. That's all communities are asking for, and that's not a Republican issue nor a Democratic issue. Right around this time last year, you and I spoke. It's why I wanted to talk to you today. You were the first person I interviewed on TV when the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan. Where are you on this now that we're a year out? It's still painful. Um, it's painful because it's personal. I think the, the, the decision to withdraw was the right one, and... Frankly, it was just an overdue one, and I'm glad it was one of the first things that, that the administration put into place. The thing that I, we also have to consistently remind the American people is that just because people made it home does not mean the support ends there. You know, thank you for your service cannot be the end of a conversation all the time. Thank you for shouldn't your service. You shouldn't just get 10% off at Denny's. There you go. It shouldn't just be, you know what, I'll buy this person a coffee when I see someone in uniform at a coffee shop. Right. Thank you for your service actually has to mean something. We have people who, when our country asked them to serve, they didn't ask the country to wait. And so when they come back home for them and their families, our nation should not be asking us and our families to wait. Honor your promises. You are running against somebody who's not looking for unity in any way. Dan Cox is an election denier. He has come out and said he would look to have Maryland State Police go after Joe Biden for the lawful Mar-a-Lago search. How do you respond to that? Uh, I respond by first making sure that people know who our opponent is in November. And I'm very clear, you know, I, I don't have an opponent in November. This is a threat. This is someone who asked for Mike Pence to be hung because he certified an election. You know, this is a person who the current governor, who's a Republican, when asked, would you support uh, my opponent, his response was, uh, I think he's mentally unstable and I would not give him a tour of the governor's office, let alone do I want him to be the next governor. Wes, I did a double take in the last week when I heard the current Republican governor say those things about your opponent. He has said he's a QAnon crazy. And then over the weekend, I'm looking and I see Wes Moore at an event with Larry Hogan. Are you seeking his endorsement? Because if you got the Republican endorsement from the governor, that would be enormous, not just for you in this state, but a, a statement to this country. I want to be very clear that uh, I would love his support and the support of anybody. Have who, you asked him for it? I, I have not asked him for his, for his, uh, for his official endorsement yet. Why not? Uh, maybe I should right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but I, I would love the governor's support um, because I'd love the support of anybody who believes that our vision and our values are better reflective of the vision and the values for the state of Maryland than, of, than my opponent. But here's the thing. Governor Hogan did endorse a Republican primary candidate, and Dan Cox beat them handily. What does that tell you about the Republican voter in this state? I believe that Republicans need to be able to hear uh, what the alternative actually is. You know, when we're going all around the state, and people are telling us, you know, you're going to a lot of places that there's not a lot of Democrats. My answer is, yeah, but there's a lot of Marylanders. And I plan on being their governor, too. And so the way we are planning on beating that back, because there's a very real reality that, that this, this MAGA movement, it's not going anywhere. And it is real. And we've seen that with the election of, of Dan Cox to be the Republican nominee. Uh, the way I'm going to combat it is we're going to every neighborhood. And we're going to every community. And I'm going to ask them for their vote. I'm going to ask them for their support. I'm going to share our vision and our values because I believe if we do that, we're not just going to win this election. We're going to win this decade. 
and we're going to we're going to win this decade. Maryland will win this decade, and we are going to show the country that that what people are tired of is they're tired of of being at each other's throats. People are exhausted, and people just want elected officials and leaders to be able to focus on them. Do Marylanders realize they could elect somebody who could really hurt abortion access? Something people in Maryland. Much like people in New York, we take for granted. Yes, I mean, I, I'm running against an opponent who, the day after the Supreme Court robbed millions of women of health care, his response was to praise Donald Trump and praise the Supreme Court, and then said he would double down by essentially criminalizing all abortions, even in the case of incest and rape. That's my opponent in November. Do people know that? Uh, they they do, and uh, and I think that people in Maryland also understand that this issue is something that I take very seriously and very personally. You know, it's the reason that back in the fall, I called for us to make make sure that Maryland is a safe haven for abortion rights. And even when people said, "Well, that's not an issue. Why are you bringing it up?" I said, "Nothing's an issue until it is an issue." The latest move from the Supreme Court is scary, um, irrelevant of how you feel about abortion rights. This is the first time we've seen the Supreme Court start to Hold take up, yes. things away. Yeah. What does that tell you about where we are? What it tells us is we have to remember that uh, that progress is not guaranteed. We've got to fight. Every day we have to fight for what makes this country so beautiful and so important and what makes it worth fighting for. Time alone and duration does not make progress. It's hard work, it's determination, and it's being assertive about what our values are and standing up for our values. That's what makes progress.